This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Quiet on the set. Soon we will all be more informed. We appreciate learning more of our region's news and public affairs. Cameras rolling. Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, on one side of Canal Street, there will be parades and brunches and Easter finery this weekend. On the other side, it'll be just another quiet weekend amidst buildings that are increasingly empty. And this is a season of renewal, we will look at signs of hope for the business district. Well, everyone is hoping for better deals on crawfish. We will examine the industry and its pricing structure. Elsewhere, a court ruling may affect the Archdiocese's sexual abuse legal issues. And with the Passover season approaching, we will look back at the Jewish experience in New Orleans. Plus, we will discuss the relationship between happiness and unhappiness and social media. Joining us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Stephanie Regal, staff writer of the Times-Picayune, the New Orleans advocate. Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter. And Tan Trung, digital content producer, WWL Radio. And we're going to go over to Stephanie first because you had a piece about how the CBD's looking these days in terms of people filling the offices there, and it's, it's really not looking that great. It's not looking that great, and it's, it's, it was a sad sort of story, just a, a look on the ground to see what that reality looked like in comparison to the numbers that we've seen. You know, uh, a, a new office report came out just two weeks ago that showed that occupancy on paper is hovering just below 80%, and that's lower than it's been in a long time, mm -hmm. but it's not terribly low compared to other office markets around the country, and it's not that much lower than it was last year. You know, before the pandemic, we were in the mid to upper 80s, 90s in some cases. Now it's dropped down to about 79%, mm -hmm. though the good news is that rental rates are up a little bit. So the tenor of the report was, yeah, things aren't that bad. However, when you talk to people on the ground, when you look at the storefront to see what kind of retail and restaurants are surviving there off of the office buildings. The traditional, what we think of as the traditional CBD, those blocks between Poydras and Canal, mm -hmm. and even the first couple of blocks of the warehouse district going in the other direction upriver, it, it's, it's looking really kind of sad. And I think the big problem is that many of the office workers that got used to working from home during the pandemic just haven't come back yet. And there's not great data on you know what percentage of the 80% that are in the buildings actually have bodies in the cubicles yeah. and offices downtown. But when you talk to the store owners, when you talk to the restaurant owners, particularly that for decades literally made their livings off of the lunch crowd, they say things are really empty and they all would say the same thing. It was almost like I had a, a recorder and they were all mm -hmm. just saying it over and over again, like the regulars don't come in. We used to see the same guys and, and ladies three or four times a week. And now maybe once a week, they're like, oh, hey, you know, I work on Wednesdays now. And that is really sad to hear mm -hmm. because the CBD, we really did have a healthy CBD, you know, and, and certainly in comparison to some others around the country, it's just not bustling like that anymore. And one of the longtime business owners whose company is still in the CBD said, really, the sense of vibrancy that we had pre-COVID isn't, isn't there yet. Now, I think it's, it's important to remember that the CBD has been, say, in the midst of a transition for a long time, going back to, say, even the 80s, after the oil boom that, that we talked right. about on the right. Look Back show last week or week before last, when, you know, companies started leaving and, and our city really navigated the transition from a strictly business district to much more of a, a live, work, play kind of district that catered heavily to tourists and also a growing and healthy number of professionals, young professionals or empty nesters that moved downtown and a, lot, and a vibrant restaurant scene. But until COVID, it was still a good mix, mm -hmm. I think, of everything. Not great. I mean, New Orleans has its problems, but but good for sure. And it is it is not that great anymore. And 
that sense, perhaps, of that it's dirty, that it's not safe? Uh, I mean, I think on paper it's not necessarily true that the CBD is more dangerous than anywhere else. In fact, it's probably a lot less so, but there is that perception because you do have have some of the systemic problems that, that create that sense of unease, that, that public safety concerns, and, and so that's Parking also. I mean, parking it, is an issue. It's parking expensive Parking is a park tremendous park. issue, yeah. The, it's also the parking issue that everybody's going to face. But, you know, the people who haven't come back, they're not going to come back, all right? Why? Okay. That they're, um, I think their their lives have changed. You know, they can work at home on the Internet, Zoom. They can do their meetings by Zoom now. I mean, the technology of office meetings has just changed dramatically. There are yeah. corporations, though, that are starting, at least in other cities, right. they're starting to demand their workers be back. They're not going to pay these high-priced city leases and have empty offices. So there, are, I mean, I have friends around the country yeah. who are like, oh, I've been used to working at home, and shoot, i got to figure out how to dress and how to get up in the morning and get to the office again. So we may see that happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, I... I I've, I've played armchair sociologists and called it wrong in the past, so I, I would hesitate to say they're never coming back, but I would think they are, they, it is, things have definitely changed. There's been a paradigm shift. I think you'll see some come back. I don't think they're all going to come back, and I can promise you they're not going to come back to the same extent that they ever once right. did. It's a hybrid situation. I would say it's not unique to here, too, yeah. particularly, it's not. particularly the downtown areas of major cities. I mean, those mm -hmm. are becoming increasingly vacant, and as you mentioned, yeah. it's, you know, the revitalization is usually based around this idea of live work. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing probably that's going to be the next phase. Uh, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball on no. this. You know, CBD. and a lot of the, the CBD mid-rise buildings, the older ones that were built in the early part of the 20th century, those have already been converted to apartments, condos, short-term rental complexes and such. We're, we're left now with the big, tall buildings from the 70s and 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Well, not 90s, but 70s and 80s. And how do you convert those into, into something that can, that can house residents or, or tourists? Right. And it's a much more expensive and daunting proposition. Well, you talked to Merritt Lane with Canal Barge. You know, they own the building, and he has hopes that people will be coming back. He still believes in our CBD. Well, he believes in the importance of the mm -hmm. CBD for the same reasons that probably all of us and many others do as well. He is is um, he hopes that it will come back. You know, he is he's a little bit taken a, a, a wait and see approach, but his company is committed to it because he he's the kind of civic leader who really believes it's important. But he did, you know, admit that it's difficult for mm -hmm. his his employees who have to pay for their own parking right. because of their building. And it's a beautiful building, but they don't have their own parking lot or garage. So his folks, and that's like 11 or $12 a day. You know, that's a lot. Yeah, it, yeah, it definitely adds mm -hmm. up. And then, of course, just, you know, the hassle of getting down there and rush hour or whatever rush hour looks like these days. We, we do see sort of a hybrid work situation, too, happening, don't right. we? Right. And, and it was interesting. A lot of the restaurant folks and, uh, and other retail and service providers that I talked to said that, that they'll be a lot busier in the middle of the week than they are on Mondays and Fridays. You know, it seems to this, this new work that has sort of set in that Errol refers to it seems to keep people like to work from home on mm -hmm. maybe say Friday through Monday right. and then they, they venture nice out. Sounds to me. They, put on the, <laughs> they, they take off the yoga pants and, and dry their hair and go out on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Yeah, right. Okay, well, I guess we'll see, you know, just yeah. kind of like Merritt Lane says, things sort of ebb and flow and we'll Thank just you. see where it, where it continues to go. Okay. All right, Stephanie, great piece, thanks. All right, Tom, let's talk something real important for this time of year. Absolutely. Um, the crawfish, where are they and when they are there, how much do they cost? You had a great piece on your podcast talking to a, a crawfish grower. And um, tell people first, uh, where can they hear this piece? Where, do they, where can they go to hear your story? So people can find the Tan Report, and <clears throat> obviously my name is not a common one, so it's T-H-A-N-H Report. They can uh -huh. find it anywhere on their podcast platforms, or they can just search for it online, and the episodes are all there archived as well. And a couple of weeks ago I visited... Uh, David Savoy up in Eunice. He's near Church Point. He's been a crawfish farmer for roughly 40 years, and he has a 1,600-acre farm. He's a crawfish farmer, but uniquely, he's also the president of the Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, so he can speak on behalf of the crawfish industry as well. And what I really wanted to do was just figure out what it a what it takes to get crawfish from the farm to our boils and to our tables, and b who sets these prices because I think. At the end of the day, that's what we as the consumer care about is how much is the boiled crawfish or can I pick up a sack of live crawfish for my boils? And what I found, what he told me was fascinating in terms of 
you know, this idea, and I think the common understanding for most of us is that the crawfish farmer is the one who is selling the crawfish and he'll set the prices. Um, from what David Savoy told me, that's not the case. Um, it's a little bit more nebulous once you start inserting the, the middle people or what they call the docks. And that's the common understanding for some within the industry is that the quote unquote docks set the, the prices. Um, but you know, the way that he boiled it down uh, really was, and it made sense to me is that, look, he said, I have a live product. I have live crawfish, I must move. It's not the case where I'm gonna tell the distributor or the person who picks it up, this is what I'm gonna sell it for. He says most of the time, almost all the time, they're coming in saying, this is the price I will give you for your crawfish because they have to move that product. So we've seen certainly you know, much less crawfish than what we're used to seeing um, during this crawfish season here in this Easter season too, when crawfish is a staple on this Good Friday. Um, it's just harder to find and they certainly are more expensive. What's been the problem? Where'd the crawfish go? So you can go back to last year. So we had uh, one of the hottest summers on record, but also uh, very intense drought conditions. And that affects the crawfish because you, you have to figure that, you know, these farmers are raising these crawfish within ponds um, when the conditions on the ground are not suitable for the crawfish. Um, and there's a much deeper science here. And obviously I'm not a crawfish farmer, but the heat conditions and the drought conditions yeah. made it very difficult for these crawfish to get to a point where they matured and laid eggs. Um, so that was a year before, and now it's sort of a, a lagging result here. Um, you have fewer crawfish because of the drought that happened. Uh, but in addition to that, there's something else that some farmers believe is going on with environmentally. Mm -hmm. um, they can't quite put their finger on it, and if people listen to the podcast, mm -hmm. David Savoy said, usually I have drips coming from my window units in my house and when I go out in the morning there will be crawfish everywhere but not this particular year and he thinks there's something else going on and you know sometimes you have to defer to the people who know it best and I think the crawfish farmers who have staked their livelihood on this um, know something a bit more than us so it's hard to say you know what particularly mm -hmm. is for the shortage and you can trace it back to the drought and you know the governor has declared a, right. a disaster declaration for the industry itself um, but there might be something bigger at play. Ton, your um, presentation raises the question, who ultimately decides the prices? Who, do, who does? Well, uh, David Savoy said that he knows. Um, he didn't want to quite name them, um, but he said it's usually the middlemen, uh, and mm -hmm. that is a group of people who are politically connected. Um, those are people with deep pockets, and ultimately they need, he says that they're a necessary evil. You need, if you're a crawfish farmer, you need the distributor, you need those middlemen to move your product to us, the people. And we, the people, don't necessarily want to drive up to Eunice or Church Point to get right. a 30, you know, 30 pound sack of crawfish for our boils. We'd rather go to our neighborhood market and pay what we hope to be $3.99, $2.99, but early in the season we saw right. prices north of 1099, which is outrageous for many people. And it's come down a little bit for this, for this Easter weekend. I want you to touch on quickly also the Crawfish app and the uh, woman that you talked to who um, has, the, she and her husband established this Crawfish app, which is, seems to be very popular, especially right now. Oh, absolutely. And, and what a Louisiana thing, yeah. right, is <laughs> right. a Crawfish oh. app and, <laughs> right. you know, Louisiana ingenuity. But uh, Lainey King, she and her husband, they're both LSU grads. In 2017, they established the Crawfish app, and it's been referenced a lot in media, and it basically serves as a guide. So if people remember when, you know, all, all the gas prices were going wild several years back, Gas Buddy, people would usually go on gasbuddy.com and search for the, the cheapest place in the search, uh, you know, the station that had the cheapest gas. You can relatively do the same thing on the Crawfish app. Um, and you can use it by filter and by quality and by rating of the restaurateur or the distributor. Um, but she said right now, the biggest filter that people are using is the price. They want, yeah. people want the cheapest price. And she said, you know, look, Easter Sunday in just a couple of days is the Super Bowl of crawfish mm -hmm. boils. I mean, everybody wants to have a crawfish boil for Easter Sunday and that's becoming increasingly difficult this year. So the crawfish app, you can find out who has it and how much it might be. Yes, okay. if you want, yeah, you can find, you know, they have 1,600 um, retailers listed within the crawfish app. Uh, they have 700,000 downloads and again, you know, it's 
a tip to the hat to some Louisianians that will come up with something called oh, the crawfish. I, I love it. I really do. But, of course, Mr. Savoy said to get the freshest and the best, you just go to the grower like him and buy that sack of crawfish. Yeah, just uh, be ready to fill up your tank of gas because it yeah, takes a little while to get up to, to, to Church Point. All right. All right, Tom. It's really great. It's really very interesting to to hear more about how the crawfish indeed do come our way from a farm, farmer's point of view. And I think sometimes we need to be more connected to where yeah. our food comes from, and Good idea. Know, yeah. especially for, for something like crawfish. Yep. All right, Tom, thanks a lot. Okay, Amy, we're going over to you because we're talking about crawfish over this Easter holiday, but of course um, the Jewish faith is going to observe Passover also in the month of, e of April, so you wanted to kind of talk about the Jewish experience in yeah. New Orleans. Yeah, Passover is a little bit later this year because of some quirky thing that we four years, they push it back a month, but, but anyway, it's in late April, but it's all the same season, okay? But the, um, first of all, I, I want to recommend that the place downtown called the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at 818 Howard Avenue. It's been open, I guess, about three years. Uh, it's a delightful exhibit. Uh, I, I recommend everybody go and see it. And while you're there, make a day of it. Go there in the morning and then you're in walking distance from the World War II Museum and go over there. And certainly the um, impression you get of the Southern Jewish experience is a lot different than uh, the impression you get of the Jewish experience during, during World War II. But you talk to people, um, I think the, the museum will give you the impression, but also I've talked to people who have been leaders in the Jewish community, and they all say that the, the Southern Jewish experience has been basically good. That there's been good relationships. There hasn't been any real hostility, except for maybe David Duke, but he didn't like anybody, okay? But uh, everybody else, uh, certainly the, the Jewish... We didn't like white people. Well, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't, like, they didn't like Catholics either. In the end, the people here didn't like him, I mean, when they had the election, okay? But the... Uh, um, in, in terms of philanthropists, that they've been really, really important. You, you look at the museums and Turo Hospital and just a lot of places. Uh, in, in terms of job development through retail, um, um, Godshaw's and Krauss and many of the major stores. Uh, but all the 900 block of Canal Street was developed uh, by uh, uh, Jewish developers. And so they've been very important as a source of jobs and as a source of, of, of financial support. And so it seems like it's been overall a happy experience. I, I know there's religious animosities here and there, but it's not, it hasn't been anything major. So that's been a, a good experience. The other thing, though, I just want to mention is there's this book that came out this, um, actually came out late last year. Uh, it's, called, it's called The Sugar King, and it's about Leon Gottschall, the guy who developed Gottschall's department store, also developed Gottschall's sugar. And this is a kid who came here um, from France. He was Jewish, but he came here from France by himself. And he made contacts, and then ultimately he became a, a, a peddler, and he would go up, up the river and sell things to different plantations. And so through that, he got to know the plantation country. And which became a very important part of, uh, part of his life because he was a peddler, so he learned retail, and then he was out in the plantation company uh, country, and he learned that that area. Ultimately, he developed uh, Godshaw's store, which was a very very important store, and he, that was coming existence around the same time that the Singer sewing machine was becoming popular, and he was able to use that one of the first to utilize that to really more tailor clothes instead of all clothes being off the rack. That he was, uh, it, it became very popular, for, uh, uh, you know, for being able to really tailor clothes. So it became very, very big. Uh, and then ultimately he got into the sugar business. He developed Godshaw's sugar. He bought a lot of the old plantation um, stock and, and he developed a major, major sugar industry. Uh, so big and so widespread. He even had his own railroad to go from place to place to mm. carry stuff. And so, and he became the model, the Godshaw sugar became the model for other sugar refiners around the country. Uh, there's even a picture in this book of uh, a delegation of, uh, from Washington uh, coming here to, to study how they did it. And so it was uh, a real success story. Right. And so for folks today, the Southern, uh, the Museum of the Southern Jew Jewish Experience, um, it's open. Give me the address again. Where is it? 818 on Howard, Howard Avenue. On Howard yeah. Avenue, yeah. right. And so it's not shout too far between the Superdome and, and, and yeah. the museum. And and shout so out it, to it, Kenneth Hoffman on that, who, who helped establish that and is running it, and who actually comes from the National World War II Museum. He was the education yeah. coordinator. So and while you're there in their bookstores, the museum, they sell this book. I really okay, recommend good. it because Perfect. you really get a lot of history of, the, of New Orleans retail and the Jewish community. All righty. Thanks a lot. Don, over to you. You're talking about our happiness. How happy are we? We are not that happy <laughs> as a nation. The World Happiness Report has recently been released, and um, Finland is number one again. The United States dropped from 15 down to 23rd. Mm -hmm. 
For those who are the naysayers in the audience and want to know, the worst happiness nation, that's Afghanistan. Um, but the rankings are based on an evaluation from the Gallup World Poll. And in the happiest countries, they tend to have a higher GDP per capita, a strong social support system, higher life expectancy, greater freedom, absence of government corruption, and just more social interaction. To which point we're going to talk about a little bit of social media. You know, the United States government is looking per perhaps to ban TikTok, not because of its effect on our happiness, but because of our data going to the Chinese government. We'll see what happens with that. But perhaps social media is something we should discuss about in terms of overall happiness. Um, I spoke with a counselor who deals primarily with youth, but it, it applies across the board that social media causes one of the biggest problems it seems to cause for humans is FOMO, or the fear of missing out, which was actually added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 2013. Mm -hmm. It's not as new a term as we all think. Um, it's very common in teens and young adults. Um, one survey found that two-thirds of people in the 18 to 33 age group said they feel FOMO regularly. 24 percent of people in that age group are online constantly, and they worry about what others are doing that they're missing out on. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that feeds itself. When you're worried that you're missing out, you end up posting things about your own life that make it look like your life is glamorous, great pictures, fun activities. And we all might have our Friday nights at home watching a movie or whatever, where we don't have exciting plans. Um, In terms of making our happiness better, they say our three greatest sources of happiness are times with family, especially extended family, maybe not just your nuclear family, time with friends, and free time. And the biggest reasons that we are unhappy is anxiety, which can be caused by seeing what other people are doing that you're not invited to, um, a feeling of entitlement, Uh, and which is primarily in the United States, mostly among the affluent people, we're entitled to these great things, and if we don't have them, it tends to make us more distressed, and fear of missing out. So the steps they suggest we all take, besides maybe dialing back the social media use and, mm -hmm. and getting off the screens and outside and among friends, are to make a gratitude list, um, monotask and solve one problem at a time so things don't seem so overwhelming, and to focus on the things that are con that are controllable not focus on the things outside of ourselves. Um, there is a, a very real and, and troublesome correlation between the amount of time people spend on their digital technology mm -hmm. and their feelings of stress and depression. Interesting, isn't it? It's just simply, you know, sort of also just have a conversations and interact with one another. Yes. Not texting all the time. But in terms of having the world at our fingertips, they say this is, it's not just social media that's distressing our kids. It's knowing about the larger problems in the world constantly and constantly you know, knowing quiet. about them, at, you know, where kids today aren't worried about homework as much as they're worried about crises in countries they'll never, ever visit. And that's not healthy for them either. So really trying Trying to dial that back, dial yeah. back their access to some of that information that, yeah. that's more frightening and out of their control. Yeah. Also, on things that are said that could be deemed newsworthy, there's not the discipline that there is in the journalism profession. You know, if any of you would mm -hmm. say anything, you'd have to go to your sources and verify them. Mm -hmm. People go on Facebook and say anything they want. Right. right? And, Although I will tell you, my daughter solved one of her own medical problems using TikTok. It does have, <laughs> I mean, and uh, kids have found great recipes. I mean, they have, there are positive outcomes from these things. It's just a matter of control. Uh, controlling you know? them and, and, yeah, modifying the use. All right, Don, thanks a lot. Complex issue, for sure. Real quick to you, Stephanie, because there was a court ruling um, that impacts um, the uh, survivors of sexual abuse um, right. in, late, in the late Catholic last Church. Right, Friday, just a, a week ago, in fact, the state Supreme Court ruled in a case that came out of the Diocese of Lafayette over this look-back window that the state legislature had created in the 21 and 22 sessions that basically opened a window for three years, closing this June, that gave survivors of child sex abuse unlimited time to file suits and claims against their alleged abusers, meaning they could go back as, as far as, as, you know, prior to that, there was basically a one-year statute mm -hmm. of limitations, which effectively ruled out most claims in sex abuse cases because a five or six year old child or or 15 year old for that right. matter wouldn't be able to have the the presence of mind and access the resources necessary to file a suit against their alleged accuser but this basically throws into question many um, and we're not sure how many of the claims that have been filed in the archdiocese of new orleans 
bankruptcy case, which mm -hmm. was filed almost four years ago now, to shield the church from claims of abuse by some 300 uh, clerics in so the diocese. So it was called the look back, and that was, rolled, <clears throat> that was what the court threw out. Yes. But it would have given people up to June of 2024 the chance to file mm -hmm. their suit. Now that's gone. Now that, that law is unconstitutional. So that's what I was saying. It's unclear mm -hmm. exactly how this will affect the 550 or so claims that have been filed in our archdiocese case against 300 alleged abusers, mostly priests and some deacons and brothers and other religious. So those who have filed their cases in the, within this, you know, time frame, mm -hmm. um, it, it, are they all just now automatically dismissed? No, no, not necessarily, but they'll each have to be evaluated on their own merits if they were outside of the, of the one-year time limit that sort of now reverts back to, to law that, it, you know, that is constitutional. And so there are extenuating circumstances allowed by law, including perhaps things like repressed memory, which affects many of these abuse survivors because they just buried the memory, they couldn't deal with it. Um, but those cases, there'll have to be a procedure for establishing how those cases are evaluated and whether that happens, say, before a settlement is reached in the case or after, perhaps. And this has been going on now for, in terms As of the said, cases? This, of... Case, it, this case is now four years old. Four years, okay. Mm -hmm. In May. In May, it'll be Yeah, the years list came May out first. in 2018. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. it's been going on for a while. It is one, right. of the, one of the longest running cases of mm -hmm. all of the archdiocese bankruptcy cases yet mm -hmm. to be settled. Okay, all right, Steph, thanks. All right, guys, other stories. E, over to you. We know there's a proposal um, this week from the mayor, uh, from the governor's uh, sewage and water board committee to transfer the sewage and water board to the state that still has, still got a long way to go, but the proposal's out there. There's also legislation in this week to take away the appointments to the, uh, the, the housing authority from the mayor to the state. Uh, there are several examples of power being transferred. Some of it is probably backlash to Cantrell, um, but it's happening, the whole thing about the council has to approve police chief appointments. And some of these are probably good ideas, but the next mayor is not gonna be as o overall powerful as previous mayors have been, mm -hmm. because just more and more of the decision making is being transferred in a different direction. And this direction. is moving through the legislature right now, so we'll see where that goes. All right, guys, gotta go quick. Stephanie. Taking a look at, at real estate commissions and a big settlement that the National Association of Realtors made in class action lawsuit that will affect the way agents are, are, are paid. Don? Hit the streets tomorrow for the 44th Crescent City Classic. It started in 1979 with 902 oh. people. It'll be run tomorrow with more than 20,000. All right. Tom, over to you. And I'm working on a, a, another episode of the podcast, taking a look at just how large the uh, cargo containers have gotten since, you know, yeah. we saw the, the, the accident, mm -hmm. um, what seems like an accident in Baltimore with the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Okay, very good. Thanks, guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us. Have a very, very happy Easter, and we will see you again next week from Form Sources. Have a good evening. Inform Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Public television is our passion. With so much content that WYES broadcasts and presents online, we are quite entertained and highly informed. Please join us in supporting WYES. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.